Oh my goodness. I mean, come on. <laughs> I think you said there needs to be some litigation. There should be it. some litigation. <laughs> Just look at that. People stop me saying, would you want to sell that watch? No. Pretty good knockoff, Teddy. Total ripoff. Mr. Wonderful here in another episode of what I'm calling Wine and Watches. Why? Because winemaking is art, and just for shameless promotion, this is O'Leary Fine Wines we're trying. We're trying my Pinot Noir, which is very, very hard to make. Teddy's loving it, I can tell you right now. But also, we're talking about physical art, that's watches. Now, I wanted to challenge Teddy, because he's been so good at finding great value. Because one of the challenges in watch collecting is, if you're getting into the higher end pieces, you're spending $100,000, $250,000, and then the aftermarket is up to half a million, and that's not affordability whatsoever. But I want to encourage people to start collecting. So here's a really interesting idea. I said to Teddy, look, let me bring out some of my mega pieces, the monsters, the beasts, the ones that are impossible to get, that trade at crazy prices, and you find me equivalents at affordable prices. So if you can't afford a Rolex Submariner, is there something that's close to it that Teddy can find? And I think we've nailed it. So let's get at it. Teddy, you start. Show me something in, let's go with a classic, uh, Rolex Daytona. Rolex Daytona. Now there's uh, but wait, let me show you a Rolex Daytona. A crazy Rolex Daytona. Like the classic blackface Daytona. Ichiwawakaramba. You can't even get this if you wanted it. It's so hard. It's a beautiful watch. And secondary market's a ridiculous price. That's the problem. Yeah, it's approaching 40. I yeah, it's, about 40,000 or 38, 40,000. Obviously, this one has a red band. It's a Shark Tank watch. Um, I don't think you should buy a $40,000 watch in the aftermarket if you can get something equivalent. What do you got, Teddy? So this was a tough one because you could go really dead on the Daytona, but then you could also look at the design attributes that make the Daytona the Daytona. And I'm going back more to like the maybe older reference Daytona. The Paul newman here. kind of vibe? Yes, that's what I'm going for. Yeah. Those old classic mid 20th century. That's chronographs. where the brand got established, the big red they call it now, all yes. that. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And the brand here, I would say almost on anything on the table, this is a brand with a ton of cachet in the arena of chronographs, and that's Hamilton. I believe that that's this- That's a is, Hamilton? This is a Hamilton. What's the price point? $2,000, just over $2,000. Wow. So this, is a watch that takes a lot of influence from the chronomatics from Hamilton. Now, Hamilton was involved in the Are automatic... Are you suggesting that Rolex ripped off Hamilton? I'm not saying somebody that. Somebody ripped somebody off. Well, here, I'll let, let's get the history. That looks a lot like... If I, if I was looking back 20 feet from that, I'd say, oh, that's a Rolex Big Red. Let's get the history right. So back in 1969, all the brands were scrambling to make the first automatic chronograph. You had the likes of Breitling, you had the likes of Hoyer, you had the likes of uh, Zenith with the El Primero. All were going after it, also Seiko with the 6139. Hamilton was also involved with Hoyer as well as Breitling in making the first automatic chronograph. What do you mean involved with? What were they? So they all collaborated their own technologies, their own just uh, minds to allow them to actually create the first automatic chronograph movement in 1969. Okay. So this watch stems from those creations. And this is known as the Intramatic. It's $2,000, Swiss made. The design attribute that I like about this is so many people that, and, they talk about Panda, Panda dials, right? You got, sure. the, they got the sub registers. Right. I think it's one of the best executions that you're gonna find. And it also does have true history. I, I didn't wanna go for a complete knockoff here. This is a brand it's that- It's pretty close. It, it's got its own history, no question about it. I, I don't think, think anybody's gonna say- it gets street cred for having its own history, but clearly these makers started to really groove off each other. It reminds me- I of, see more Breitling and Hoyer in that design than I do yeah, with Daytona I know, in a way. It reminds me of certain blues riffs and guitars. They've been around since the 50s. Everybody rips from everybody. Sure, you know, and got they, Zeppelin playing the blues yeah, riffs. And yeah, you, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. And then you give a little riff to change a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But this is a classic chronograph uh, made very famous by early Rolexes back in the 60s. I mean, this is, it's a great piece. At that price, it's fantastic. Can't go wrong. 2,000 bucks. Love the band, too. It's a great bracelet. It's okay, great that's good. Now I'm going to throw something at you. All righty. Is, this is perhaps one of the most coveted watches Oh in the world, the AP Jumbo Royal Oak, okay? Now, of course, made with a red band for Mr. Wonderful. This is a Shark Tank watch. Um, and, and this is a beautiful red band. It's integrated right to the, to the case in a gorgeous way. That blue dial, that classic design, um, not approachable in price anymore. No, it's 
It's gone bonkers. It's gone bonkers. But what do you got that's even closing in on that? I'm interested to see what you think about this one because this is where I would start. You're getting almost into the homage territory. And this is the Maurice Lacroix icon. Oh, my goodness. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I think you said there needs to be some litigation. There should be it. some litigation. <laughs> Just look at that. Look at that. So, I mean, if you can't get that, you got to get this. This is crazy. The What's only the thing price on this? What would you say it is? I don't know, 5000 2000 bucks, less than wow. 2000 Wow. Finishing on the bracelet, it, does have a, it doesn't have the screws. It has kind of more of those griff claws. I know, but it's, but it's, it's, it's right there. It is, it is right definitely there. off the theme. That's a nice piece. From it's, a finishing perspective, that is when people talk about the AP Royal Oak, what can I get? I don't have the money for it. I got two grand to spend, or maybe I have Maurice Lacroix. Mm -hmm. Swiss brand. Put those two together. Just look at that. I mean, it's... I mean, there's, you, you there, never there make should a short, be litigation. <laughs> never make a shortcut for the real thing if you can't afford it responsibly. But if you can't, I mean, this is they've I, created. I, I, I cannot endorse the secondary market on the jumbo anymore. It's gone too crazy. It's nuts. It's, 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 I can't tell you how many people have stopped me saying, "Would you want to sell that watch?" No, because I can never replace it. And I am a huge proponent of go save for the real thing, do it responsibly. But they've made it so you can't do it responsibly. So you have to look elsewhere now. That just is what it is. But I got, I mean, this is one of my go-to pieces. I wear it all the time. It, it just looks it's beautiful. Timeless. It's timeless. It's a great design. But this is a great ins inspired movement. <laughs> yeah. like, or should I say dial? You know, <laughs> yeah, it's sort sure. of really... Uh, Okay, that's good. That's a pretty good knockoff, Teddy. It's pretty good. That's <laughs> Down pretty around good. the okay, K word. Where do you want to go next? Where do you want to go next? You tell me. You tell well, me. Well, let's go. Um, I don't know. Let me try something on you here. Um, let's go Patek. You you know this piece, right? Mm -hmm. Fifty-seven twenty-six. The twenty-six. Um, crazy piece to get. I do not have a red band on this. I cannot wear it on television but I do wear it for dinner all the time and people love it. I like the symmetry of the 26, I really do. It's class with the moon phase. The moon phase looks great on the Nautilus. It, it, just, it, it really it, works, it that gorgeous. dial. What do you got that even come close to this? Well, I don't have a moon phase because uh, that's going to cost us a little extra, but I think from the silhouette of the case, you got the bracelet. Yeah. You have these kind of central polished link, kind of go with that design. I want to look at this. This is Frederic Constant, the High Life. That is not inexpensive though, is it? What do you think it is? Four thousand, two thousand dollars. You're kidding! Yeah. You're, I mean, these you're are nailing not, me on price. That's I mean, a beautiful... they're still expensive. These are aspirational pieces for many people out there. But... Oh, nice style! Whoa, look at the etching on that. The globe, eh? Cosc uh, chronometer. I mean, that's there's a chance it could be even more accurate than your Patek. I bet if we put it on a time. Yeah, graphic, it could be. It could be. Could it's be, not but... a Patek, but it is pretty damn nice. And it's kind of got that blue thing going on. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Bracelet's very nice too. I was impressed with that one. Yeah. And it's. The one I will say about that is it's not so much on the nose compared to some of the other designs here. Like the Maurice the Claw, you know, it's getting a little, you know, careful there with uh, how they're encroaching on the design of the AP. Yeah. That's a little bit more of its own thing. Okay, let I me like. throw another challenge at you. All right, I like it. The most coveted watch for many, many sports enthusiasts is the Rolex Submariner. Not approachable anymore in secondary market. Not even available in primary market. The classic steel black face, impossible to get. It doesn't matter who you are now, that watch has just gone into the stratosphere. And it's, I don't know why, nobody can really say why, because it's a production model, sure. but it is become, after the Daytona, the, the go-to Rolex. What do you got that could satisfy demand there? So I struggled with this one a little bit because there's probably a, a number of suitable options here. Well, everybody knocks it off. Yes, but I wanted to go for something that I think represents the same level of just design, it's contemporary in its approach, it's well-built ceramic bezel, nice bracelet, and it's still a nice dive watch. It's a little and more of a- And affordable. Relatively and affordable. And a true dive watch you can get And away. a true dive watch, and a true dive watch. I wouldn't say this is the most affordable option, but I think it's a definitive dive watch in its price range. Uh, can I say, would you agree with me? Sure. That pretty well every brand makes a knockoff Submariner. Somebody mentioned to me, they said, the most overrated watch is the Rolex Submariner. And I agreed, but I kind of disagreed because the thing that makes people fatigued about the Submariner is because they see it from Rolex all the time, they hear about it all the time, but they also see it almost everywhere but else. It, it, it's, it's probably one of the most successful designs yes. in history. It's coveted as a sports piece. It's coveted as a dive watch. It's coveted as a you know, collector's item, mm -hmm. and it looks great in formal wear. I mean, it really, really covers the bases. Just because something's so great, I mean, is that a knock on it? You know, I always think about that. I use an well, example. It, it like, is tiring to see it on everybody's sure. wrist in one 
sure. iteration or another. But I think it is the most knocked off look in all of watch history. You see it everywhere. It's yeah. ubiquitous. Yeah. But this now like, I'm seeing it again. See, I don't think so. Well, it's slightly, slightly. different. It's got more of a, of a cylindrical look to it. The case you know, shape is completely area. different. You yeah. have the oyster case. The, yeah. the oyster silhouette is maybe one of, outside of maybe Panerai perhaps, yeah. the most recognizable silhouette you're going to find. It's the Oris Aquas. Now, Oris is a brand, they're... I know the Oris brand. Quite, I mean, they're probably one of the largest independently run brands from more of a mass market perspective. Not a huge mass market, but they're in the hundreds of millions in sales, I would right. imagine. They're, they do quite well. Swiss made timepieces. I say the Aquas is the definitive choice for $2,000. Now. That one there, you can get it available with a manufactured caliber movement, which is a little bit more expensive. It's just over three. Yeah. When you get it with the Salida movement on the inside, you can get it for just around two. What do you recommend? You know, they've, they've been on the market for enough time. I think with if you buy it from an authorized dealer, I would go for the 10-year warranty that comes with the uh, Oris Aquas. If you like the Oris Aquas design, yeah. if you only have 2000 bucks to spend, I think you're not really you, sacrificing anything there. You are in there. the theme of a dive watch here. It, it is... It's got some Seiko-esque elements to we it. We could definitely pull out a Seiko and say that is the, yeah. the definitive choice, but I just liked how this had more of a contemporary, modern feel to it. It just felt more sub to me, but it's, it's not it's right it's there the on the black on black with the popping white, uh, you know. I mean, it, it gives it that Rolex-y vibe, but at the same time, it's got heritage with Seiko, if you'll ask me. I mean, it's got a combo of the two brands here. Nice and it's different, and it's different, and it's standard on its own. Screw it's down not, crown. Screw down crown, 300 meters of water resistance, sapphire crystal. Now, that is a manufactured movement. That's the caliber 400 in there. So, really? Yeah. It has a 10, I mean, it has a uh, five day power reserve. It's, a great, Teddy, you're bringing great value here. So, I mean, clearly, you know, um, I can't tell you how many people say, can you get me a submariner? Can you get me a steel submariner with a black dial? I mean, come on. It's just, it's never ending. Mm -hmm. Let's go to a dress watch, a classic Cartier, which is no longer affordable either, whether you're going into the gold or, I mean, the trouble is the watch market has left millions of people behind. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's, it's wrong, and it's, you know, celebrating the art of mechanical watches. Um, taking away affordability is dumb. What do you got that you could emulate Cartier? So for Cartier, I think the best option here, and this is not, I would say, a direct kind of knockoff in any way. I think this has its own design DNA, and that's from Longines. It's a brand that we, Really enjoy. Yeah. This is known as our Dolce but, Vita. Well, and she's been around long enough. Did they emulate that design? Or did they, they have in their own archive. I mean, there's a lot of they, people making this rectangular design. Because Cartier is Johnny come lately on the watch scene, if you think about it. So, I mean, outside of the tank and the Santos, I mean, the Santos has history next to pretty much every, I mean, every single wristwatch could fall behind the Santos. The rest, I mean, they of, have history. The rest of the designs are relatively new. Yes, the Balm and, and, Blues and it, of the world, it, the Rose It's, more, it's yes. more considered jewelry than collectability, although I have many Cartiers because mm -hmm. they're gift... You know, in business, they're often gifted and inscribed on and sure. et cetera, et cetera. I have many for that. Uh, but the tank is a classic. This is more Cartier Tank American, so it yeah. has that kind of more rectangular case than square also case. Also a curve that Cartier doesn't have. Yeah, which I mean, it has the curve uh, yeah. back as well, yeah. so it's going to really sit on the wrist well. Yeah. Take a look at that. I mean, I, I just think that that, I mean, also... Oh, that's so... Take a look at I this. I thought it was a Cartier. Right out of the but, gate. But also, can you see where they can maybe get some of the inspiration from, from their own archive? I mean, take a look at the sector. See what yeah. I mean? Like, look at that. Yeah. Sector dial. They kind yeah. of adapted that Yeah, to... I see it. Beautiful piece. Beautiful. And, and what I like about this is... Long price, Jean, point, price point? $1,500. bucks. Long yeah. Jean's not a jewelry brand. They're, they're a true watchmaker. They have one of the richest archives of any brand out there. People don't know that about Long Jean. They really don't. To me, Seiko and Long Jean are the best value in the industry in terms of getting great pieces. Uh, Longines is huge in Asia. It's a massive, massive brand globally, but not so much yet in North America. Mm -hmm. Left behind a little bit, but that's a great piece. It, it really is class. They're yeah. class. And, and it has street cred in that they had that design in their own archives, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right, what else you got? So we have two left on the table. Now, you mentioned the Submariner, but you could argue that maybe number two, if not number one, another one that you see everywhere from a yeah. design perspective from Rolex, the Datejust. Yeah, Datejust is probably the most classic go-to, and of late, which really surprises me, my daughter, my wife, they want to wear these larger-sized Datejust. And as a result, um, it's found its way into the unisex market, like where girlfriend-boyfriend kind of thing, mm -hmm. and made it very popular. Obviously, it's so Rolexy, it's insane, and there should be litigation. <laughs> 
So the bezels absolutely were. Oh, I was are you kidding? Yeah. Like, are you kidding? Like, call it what it is. It's a it's rip a off. It's a fluted bezel. It's a rip off. It's a fluted bezel. This is probably not the best representation of Tissot because they originally had like a hobnail bezel on this watch, yeah. and then they switched it over to this to, fluted bezel to rip off the vibe. Oh, it's a date jazz, no question about yeah. it in many ways. But first of all, I will say, you know, just take a look to, at it though. Just to backtrack a little bit, Tissot is a high quality. I would. You list. mentioned Longines. I would throw in a. Seiko, I would throw Tissot and Hamilton also in oh, the but mix. But they put there. the 1853 on this. Look at that dial, by the way. I don't know. You want to backtrack a little bit? Yeah. Like oh my goodness, that's a nice piece. But COSC certified, so you're getting accuracy here. Yeah, I mean, look, th this is playing off another brand in some ways. But Tissot, oh, yeah. there's no, one of my very, very first watches that I, I was gifted when I was 16 years old was a Tissot. Mm -hmm. Bought in Geneva. And at that time, it was considered a very credible piece, as it is today. If you're looking but, at value, it's not a premium brand. If you're looking at value, and they, and they understand that they're the entry door, entry door for Swiss watchmaking. It's nice. I got to tell you, Teddy. That's what's the price on this again? What do you think it is? Three thousand. Nine hundred and ninety-five bucks. <whistles> Pretty good, Over, right? I'm overpricing everything. You are. Yeah, because they're really good. These are good. That that's a great classic dress piece. Great bracelet. Beautiful dial, clean, good contrast, great deal. If they dropped the fluted bezel, you wouldn't be saying the same things about pulling from Rolex as much, but that's what makes it a good inclusion for a video like this. It looks to like the date does. Total ripoff. <laughs> you, got, you got one more? I do have one more. Okay. I think we know where this one's pulling inspiration from. Can you tell me? It's a ripoff of Omega. Speedmaster. All right, so let's... let's... A complete ripoff. Okay, all right, well, I'm going to answer that. So, 1971. Astronaut David Scott, yeah, mission went to the went to the moon. His Omega Speedmaster failed him. He brought his own personal bullet. They prefer that story not get out. This watch is a direct creation from that David Scott worn watch on the moon, where he actually did his moonwalk. That's known as the Bull of the Lunar Pilot. We actually showed you this one before. How much do you think that one is? Well, I'm going to start going down the feeding chain. How about twenty five hundred? <laughs> Still overshot it. You kidding? Five five hundred to six hundred dollars, depending on the well, strap option you go for. And, and where's the movement from? So that is so they're owned by Citizen Group. So Japan is who's making those movements. Yeah. So it's it's really a Japanese movement. It's a Japanese movement, and that's a high performance quartz movement. So it's going to have um, the oscillation rate. It's going to just absolutely dwarf a traditional quartz in terms yeah. of its accuracy. Well, it's, it's, it's it's beautiful. I, I mean, look, I it's it's a great. If you're not going to step up and buy the Omega. Speedmaster, which has become very popular of late. Absolutely, I'm a huge Speedmaster fan. Yeah, so Speedmaster was in the doldrums for a while, and I don't know what happened, but maybe the Snoopy or whatever it is that it occurred, it's exploded to the upside now. And also that affiliation with James Bond, I think it helped them. Yeah, with the Seamaster, I think what happened was they updated the Speedmaster. Yeah. I think they totally redefined the design, it had some good limited edition releases. and I, Omega was getting lost in the early 80s. Yes, they were. They fell in hard times. Yeah. I think what actually happened is they're reaping a lot of the benefits of Rolex pissing off their consumer base as well. I think people are like, wait, Omega, they make superb watches. Right. What am I paying all this extra money for? What well, am I waiting it's around also for? also about availability. Go into yes. a Rolex boutique anywhere. Absolutely. There's nothing there. You're just whistling in the wind. I mean, there's no inventory. And so. And that's a problem. That's a problem. You're going to piss off a lot of consumers. And yet Rolex makes millions of watches. They do? <laughs> yeah, well, they have I mean, they People are saying eight hundred thousand to a million a year. That's what they say the I output is. Nobody knows. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't doubt you. Yeah. The demand is nuts right now for them. Well, look, I'm gonna. This is actually a very, very good buy for what it is. I think it's a great piece. So you've really delivered today, Teddy. We went really high end, crazy prices, and you've come up with iterations at affordable entry levels, which is really important. That's you're delivering value there. There's no question about it. And I will say one thing, I just want to show you something I don't think that you've seen, um, new to my collection, has not been adopted yet with a red band, but do you know the Minerva movement? It's, it's actually, mm -hmm. it's, it's, its heritage comes from a stopwatch, and you see the top plunger, this measures actually a hundredth of a second. You gotta but, wind it. Yeah, I have to wind it, it's, it's lost its power, but I'll tell you something. I'm going to convert this to a red band, and I think it's going to be just absolutely fantastic. No question about it. <laughs> on the other hand, look how big it is. It's huge. It's uh, huge. I just wanted your comments on it, just while we're you know, missing. I mean, I mean, the one thing that I'll say about—I uh, think I mentioned this to you—is like a hundredth of a second on 
a larger display like that, that's yeah. when it becomes useful. I think this is some, you have your Cenograph, which yeah. is cool, but yeah. just seeing that just visual of seeing a and second just fly around. It's amazing. Yeah? That's just new to my collection. Um, Mont Blanc now owns it, which mm -hmm. is a, you know, a company that makes pens. I collect their pens. Yep. But they're keeping the heritage of the making of, of Minerva the same. Sounds like a swarm of locusts. I know, I know. But look at the movement. In the it's, and it's beautiful. It is crazy. So, you know, value-wise, unfortunately, these watches, the price points are fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. But it's hard to find a centigraph at a low price. That's the problem. Sure. That's your next challenge. That's why I brought it out. Next time we meet, you find me something in a centigraph at a price you can be an entry level. Oh, boy. That's a, that's a challenge. But that's, that's, that, that is the challenge because centigraphs are rare. They're hard to make. Um, they're complex movements. But if you'll do your work, maybe you can come up with something. I my homework to do. It's never ending. Teddy, thank you very much. You've oh, done a pleasure. great job today. Absolutely. And now you know what you can get at entry level to emulate crazy watch prices. Do not buy these. Do not buy them in the secondary market, I forbid you. Take care.